these are actually different facets of this very big and broad general category that we play with a lot. And that's this idea of wonder. It's just a sense of wonder and awe and power that objects could create in you or create an environment in which you feel a sense of wonder or awe. Things that you know, can make you feel small or create an emotional reaction or make you imagine the possibility of time travel or think about how ideas can be layered and nested or how a two-dimensional thing can be transformed into a three-dimensional object. So we've been thinking around that idea in all of the ways that you guys have been talking about and thinking about, which is pretty exciting. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually going to break up into groups of three. And each of you will have a mentor and also a curatorial consultant and we'll be working with objects that connect to three different categories. And each of those categories, like the ways you were exploring objects this morning through your shopping adventure, like the objects we've been exploring all week, the exhibitions we've been visiting, all are gonna to connect to wonder in different ways. So the quote is from Stuart Hall, and he was a, a cultural theorist, and he was originally of Caribbean ancestry, and much of his schooling happened in sort of colonial England, right? So Stuart Hall was always thinking about diaspora in terms of both being a person of Caribbean heritage, but also being a black Caribbean working in Britain. When I think of diaspora, I imagine spreading things being pushed as well as pulled in different directions uh, and kind of that mixing um, so nothing's totally clear when things are diasporic it's all kind of a conglomeration of many different ideas and even how um, intensely personal that experience is because people also change mm -hmm. past yeah. their cultures mm -hmm. so it's not just one thing is changing everything is constantly in flux um, but None of us talked about diaspora as sort of fixed, and even I think the idea of the reverse culture shock shows that even nation states and cultures and spaces aren't fixed, and everything is in flux and everything is about process. So with those sort of ideas buzzing in our head, we have these objects, and we have these objects to think about and wonder about through the language of diaspora, process, and wonder. So your fun job is sort of to excavate what stories these can tell us. I'm very drawn to shadows uh, as a metaphor and actual shadows <laughs> and the scientific value they, they give us. Uh, I've always, I love stories about shadows and be playful with the way, uh, what that could mean. And I'm curious to hear what kind of response you have to that. Maybe you have, maybe it's shown up as a metaphor at some level in your own work. So in the early 19th century, there were a number of reformers who believed that alcohol was the root of a whole bunch of social problems. Mm -hmm. And so there are often women um, who are advocating for this kind of social reform. Kind of changes that conversation a little bit when I think about it in that way, where these plates could have been at a dinner party, but perhaps with women that were in a better standing, that were critiquing a lower class um, system, yeah, which true. brings up a whole host of other issues. Like these people, it's not their fault that this is kind of what they're doing. And I, I, I haven't teased that out yet. If the artist is making um, a critique in a way that is like, oh, this group of people um, are terrible because this is what they're engaging in, or if he's bringing to light, like, oh my God, like this is what's happening and we need to talk about it and we need to figure out a way to deal with it. I'm not quite clear on which, which type of conversations occurring around these plates or what people were talking about around them. It's easy to judge others without having ever experienced it. And if this, if the artist was thinking of, from that point of view, that uh, to put in front of a a standing of people who had, did not need to worry about fresh water. And this plays into their stereotype of that trajectory. I think interpreting nature as perfect and then nature's 
connection with women is really interesting. Sometimes it's more about imitation or evocation of uh, natural forms. Um, and sometimes it's, as with um, one of the early definitions we were talking about, something without flaws. Um, and so perhaps this little drip here <laughs> would be seen um, as an imperfection. And some people say, in order to appreciate the perfect, you have to embed some sort of imperfection to highlight or throw into greater contrast um, the successes of it. So. Someone took the time to become skillful at whatever they're doing and then create this product instead of just having a mass-produced item that everyone can have. It's kind of, it's individual. Mm -hmm. Maybe individuality is perfection. That can maybe be a, a way to think about it. is an echo asking a shadow to dance. Carl Sandberg. The bottle, seen first. The bottle is brought out for the first time. The husband induces his wife just to take a drop. Seen second. He has lost his situation through drunkenness. They pawn their clothes to supply the bottle. Scene third. An execution sweeps off most of their furniture. They comfort themselves with the bottle. Scene four. Poverty drives them into the streets to beg. By this means, they still supply the bottle. Scene fifth. Cold misery and want destroy their youngest child. They console themselves with the bottle. Scene sixth. Fearful quarrels and brutal violence are the natural consequences of the frequent use of the bottle. Scene seven, the husband, in a state of furious drunkenness, kills his wife with the instrument of all their misery. The bottle has done its work. It has destroyed the infant and mother and brought the son and daughter to vice and has left the father a hopeless maniac. This plate is a transformation of a family. Um, echoes are a transformation of our own voices and shadows are a transformation of our own bodies. And what happens when those transformations that aren't really a part of ourselves, but are still an extension? How do those two things you shoot off into the universe interact with each other and what comes out of that? I am an object in diaspora. How many stories collided for me to exist? Through blood, sweat, and tears, my creator wrought the story of an adopted mother and how she could be so cruel to her people and so tender to a foreign babe. As I changed hands to sit in front of a fire, I shrouded a young woman from embers and shrouded history from the origins of my narrative. I am an object in diaspora. I am a trophy, an assertion of existence. Lucy is my maker. Living in England in 1809, Lucy was an African diasporic girl. I am a testament of her skill, intelligence, and literacy. Although imperfect, 
I am a witness to the process of learning, trial, and error, a universal experience. Her work and identity are survived through me, and you will not forget my maker. Am I an object in diaspora? Am I diasporic because of my contents? Or is it the actions around me? Or both? Or neither? I don't know where I belong in this colonial history, but who is my maker? My owner is silent. Do I represent the people who own me? I cannot incite freedom on my own. I speak for my owners, but what do they do? I am an object in diaspora. Perfection is imperfect, unstable, elusive. We approach perfection through learned parameters. By today's modern and stylistic standards, this teapot's design can be perceived as outdated, unrefined, and messy. However, to manufacturers and consumers in the 18th century in Europe, this teapot design exemplified a perfect reproduction of marble stone and a control of nature. The subject would have also functioned as a symbol of refinement. Around a tea table, participants were compelled to follow a social script centered around who sips and who serves, in what order, and how much. This teapot might have functioned as a power tool used to reinforce social etiquette. Inappropriate behavior could shatter a teapot, stain a tablecloth, burn a tongue, and expose the imperfections the ritual intended to conceal. Ultimately, perfection is a form of social control. For the maker of this teapot, perfection might have been fulfilling a quota of viable items produced. For the manufacturer, perfect products were efficiently produced and profitable. For the consumer, this perfection reflected a socially constructed and personal ideal. Perfection can be followed, redefined, or broken, as easily as a teapot. Objects that survive invite us to re-examine changing notions of perfection. Perfection.